It is night in your seven kingdoms now, the Red Woman went on. But soon the sun will rise again. The war continues, Davos Seaworth, and some will soon learn that even an ember and the ashes can still ignite a great blaze. The old maester looked at Stannis and saw only a man. You see a king. You are both wrong. He is the Lord's Chosen, the warrior of fire. I have seen him leading the fight against the dark. I have seen it in the flames. The flames do not lie, else you would not be here. It is written in a prophecy as well. When the red star bleeds and the darkness gathers, Azor Ahai shall be born again amidst smoke and salt to wake dragons out of stone. Hey everyone, Crow Food's daughter here, and if you click this video, you have reached the Disputed Lands. In today's video, we will be examining one of the most debated topics in the A Song of Ice and Fire fandom, the identity of Azor Ahai. I was actually given this challenge last year that I had originally shied away from because it's a big topic. But in the end, I sat down and went to work. And I do believe I have uncovered some things to add to the conversation. So without further ado, we are going to dive right in. Now let's get started. So Azor Ahai. Azor Ahai is a legendary hero from the East who lived thousands of years ago. He is claimed to have fought the forces of darkness during the original Long Night and wielded Lightbringer, a flaming sword that was tempered through the heart of his wife, Nissa Nissa. This ancient legend looms large over the present timeline as Azor Ahai is fated to one day return and many of the signs of Azor Ahai returning have seemingly revealed themselves and a new Long Night appears inevitable. Melisandre of Ashai, a priestess of R'hllor, believes Stannis Baratheon to be the long-awaited savior, and she is our main source of information for this specific prophecy. Melisandre was robed all in scarlet satin and blood velvet, her eyes as red as the great ruby that glistened at her throat, as if it too were a fire. In the ancient books of Ashai, it is written that there will come a day after a long summer when the stars bleed, and the cold breath of darkness falls heavy on the world. In this dread hour, a warrior shall draw from the fire a burning sword, and that sword shall be Lightbringer, the red sword of heroes, and he who clasps it shall be Azor Ahai come again, and the darkness shall flee before him. Despite Melisandre's assertions of Stannis Baratheon being Azor Ahai reborn, the fandom has some other ideas, because the clues throughout the text point to Azor Ahai being almost anyone but Stannis. Ever since the introduction of the Azor Ahai prophecy, readers have been speculating on who this prophecy could be referring to. And there are of course some fan favorites and some heavy contenders, such as Daenerys Targaryen who hatched dragons from stone beneath a bleeding star or Jon Snow, who has dreams of fighting the others while wielding a flaming sword, and it is implied in the text, and confirmed in the Ice and Fire app, that Melisandre had seen Jon in her flames when she asked for a vision of Azor Ahai. There are of course some dark horse candidates like Bran Stark or Jaime Lannister, long shots like Drogon, Rhaegar, Theon, or Victarion. There are even humorous theories that bring forth candidates like Hot Pie and Sir Pounce the Cat. Basically, if there is a mildly important character in the series, you can bet someone has written a theory about it. This is truly one of the greatest mysteries and obsessions of the fandom. To make this topic even more complicated, the television show further confounded things as many show watchers were under the assumption that this hero's identity would present itself by the series finale. But instead, it only left more questions. Was Azor Ahai John, who didn't play as large of a role, but did stab Daenerys in a very Azor Ahai fashion? Or was Azor Ahai Danny, who hatched dragons out of stone beneath a bleeding star, but was given an ending similar to Nissa Nissa? Or was it Arya who killed the Night King? Or Bran who won the Game of Thrones and was crowned king? Ultimately, 
Our author has stated that the ending will not be the same, but that many of the broad strokes are there. So, if there are any clues hinting toward the identity of Azora High, they can be difficult to ascertain. Despite the many candidates within the book series, and the confusion within the ending of the Game of Thrones television series, I believe it is possible to wrap our heads around this topic. But to do this, we need to examine several things, beginning with The Prince That Was Promised. The Prince That Was Promised is a title that is used by both Melisandre and Maester Aemon interchangeably with Azor Ahai. The Prince That Was Promised is believed by many in the fandom to be another ancient prophecy potentially of Valyrian origin, and within the fandom there are two groups of readers. Those who believe the prince that was promised is simply a variation of the Azor Ahai prophecy, and those who believe the prince that was promised is an altogether different prophecy that foretells of an altogether separate savior. For those of the school of thought that the two terms reflect separate heroes, there are three arguments that stand out. First, the two may come from different regions. One, the Azor Ahai prophecy, originates from ancient Ashai. While the prince that was promised is believed by many readers to be Valerian in origin, we also see a difference in name, as one is referred to as a promised prince, while the other is referred to as Azor Ahai. Another argument is that if the two prophecies refer to two different heroes, it would make sense from a narrative standpoint as we have two very strong contenders for Azor Ahai, one who has literally awakened stone dragons beneath a bleeding star and pretty much already fulfilled this prophecy, and we have another who has dreams of fighting the others with a flaming sword, whom Melisandre sees in her flames when she asks for a glimpse of Azor Ahai. And if Jon Snow's parentage is correct, and he is the son of both a Stark and a Targaryen, he would then embody the Song of Ice and Fire, Rhaegar referred to in Danny's House of the Undying Vision. So, there are some good arguments for these being separate prophecies. But, on the other hand, there is also pretty strong evidence to conclude otherwise. You see, the main characters we get our information from regarding the prince that was promised and Azor Ahai use the two terms interchangeably. Melisandre, who is a priestess of R'hllor, uses the term her religion prefers, Azor Ahai. Maester Aemon, who is of Valyrian descent, generally chooses the term the prince that was promised, but both use the two terms interchangeably. Stannis rounded on him in a cold fury. I know his name. Spare me your reproaches. I like this no more than you do, but my duty is to the realm. My duty. He turned back to Melisandre. You swear there is no other way? Swear it on your life, for I promise you shall die by inches if you lie. You are he who must stand against the other, the one whose coming was prophesied five thousand years ago. The Red Comet was your herald. You are the prince that was promised, and if you fail, the world fails with you. In addition to the terms being used interchangeably, we also have Rhaegar, who at one point believed he was the prince that was promised. And here we see Maester Aemon mentioning a bleeding star amidst smoke and salt in reference to this. No one ever looked for a girl, he said. It was a prince that was promised not a princess. Rhaegar, I thought. The smoke was from the fire that devoured Summerhall on the day of his birth, the salt from the tears shed for those who died. He shared my belief when he was young, but later he became persuaded that it was his own son who fulfilled the prophecy, for a comet had been seen above King's Landing on the night Aegon was conceived, and Rhaegar was certain the bleeding star had to be a comet. So, the interesting implication in this passage is that the prince that was promised also contains the same elements as the Azor Ahai prophecy. And for what it's worth, we also have the HBO show who only used the term the prince that was promised and not the term Azor Ahai in order to avoid confusion. If the two terms were separate concepts and separate heroes 
from a narrative standpoint, the ending of A Game of Thrones might have made more sense and caused less confusion. But instead, there is only reference to one messianic savior. So because Azor Ahai and the prince that was promised are used interchangeably and contain the same elements, it does appear they are referring to different cultural versions of the same prophecy. But if they are the same prophecy, we are faced with another issue. As stated previously, the main argument of those who believe the two prophecies are referring to separate and unique saviors is that it really is the best and only way to make sense of two very strong contenders for Azor Ahai we have in our present story. So the question is now, how can there be two strong contenders if there is only one Azor Ahai? And to answer that, we need to take a closer look at the Targaryen obsession with the prince that was promised. As you may have noticed, there have been several Targaryens who seem to have been very aware of or influenced by the prince that was promised prophecy. Rhaegar, who at one point thought himself to be the prince that was promised, is one who especially sticks out within the pages of A Song of Ice and Fire. But there were several others who have displayed similar behaviors. For example, Jaehaerys II had gone so far as to heed the advice of a woods witch and marry his two children after she had foretold that the prince that was promised would be born from their line. Why did they wed if they did not love each other? Your grandsire commanded it. A woods witch had told him that the prince that was promised would be born of their line. A woods witch? Danny was astonished. In addition to Rhaegar and Jaehaerys II, the first Ares was famously bookish and was said to have spent his life in the library reading dusty tomes concerned with ancient prophecy. In the Duncan Egg novellas, a young Aegon V recalled that King Ares once read about the return of dragons in a prophecy. Egg lowered his voice. Someday the dragons will return. My brother Daeron dreamed of it, and King Ares read it in a prophecy. Maybe it will be my egg that hatches. That would be splendid. In his later life, Aegon V would be consumed with seeking out knowledge of how to return dragons to the world, and had sought information from the far reaches of the known world, including Ashai. It was this desire to hatch dragons that ultimately led to his death and the death of several family members in the tragedy of Summerhall. Interestingly, there were two Targaryens who believed they themselves would be transformed into dragons upon their fiery deaths. Although we are never told why or how these Targaryens came to these conclusions, it is said that Arian Brightflame drank wildfire in the belief that he himself would be transformed into a dragon, while Ares II had commanded the Red Keep burn during the sack of King's Landing, in the belief that he would survive and be reborn as a dragon while his enemies would burn. Lord Husband, said Queen Selyse, you have more men than Aegon did 300 years ago. All you lack are dragons. The look Stannis gave her was dark. Nine mages crossed the sea to hatch Aegon III's cachet of eggs. Valor the Blessed prayed over his for half a year. Aegon IV built dragons of wood and iron. Arian Brightflame drank wildfire to transform himself. The mages failed, King Baylor's prayers went unanswered, the wooden dragons burned, and Prince Arian died screaming. So there are some obvious reasons the Targaryen dynasty would become obsessed with restoring dragons to the world. It is a part of their heritage and a source of their strength. Having a dragon by your side would strike fear into anyone's enemies. But the obsession with the prince that was promised, to the point where we have princes convinced they are the embodiment of a chosen savior that will one day save the world from darkness. Well, that is another matter. To understand why the Targaryens believe they are destined to fulfill the Azor Ahai or Prince that was promised prophecy, you really have to take a closer look at the prophecy, specifically within Maester Aemon's comments. No one ever looked for a girl, he said. It was a prince that was promised, not a princess. Rhaegar, I thought. 
The smoke was from the fire that devoured Summer Hall on the day of his birth. The salt from the tear shed for those who died. He shared my belief when he was young, but later he became persuaded that it was his own son who fulfilled the prophecy, for a comet had been seen above King's Landing on the night Aegon was conceived, and Rhaegar was certain the bleeding star had to be a comet. What fools we were, who thought ourselves so wise! The error crept in from the translation. Dragons are neither male nor female. Barth saw the truth of that, but now one, and now the other, as changeable as flame. The language misled us all for a thousand years. Daenerys is the one, born amid salt and smoke. The dragons prove it. And there it is. Do you see it? The error crept in from the translation. Dragons are neither male nor female. Barth saw the truth of that. But now one, and now the other, as changeable as flame. The language misled us all for a thousand years. According to Maester Aemon, the word dragon is used to describe this hero within this prophecy, and he is stating that the use of this term is where the error crept in. Like many Targaryens who refer to themselves as dragons, or having the blood of the dragon, this nuance was probably not unique to the Targaryen family alone. Before the Doom, it is quite possible the Dragonlord families of Old Valyria would have referred to themselves in much the same fashion. According to the World Book, Sheltered there, amidst the great volcanic mountains known as the Fourteen Flames, were the Valerians, who learned to tame dragons and make them the most fearsome weapon of war that the world ever saw. The tales the Valerians told themselves claimed they were descended from dragons and were kin to the ones they now controlled. As discussed in my Origin of Dragons videos, there is truth to the Valyrian claims of possessing the blood of the dragon, and that dragons and dragon lords were not unique to Valyria alone. Before the rise of Valyria, the origin of dragons was rooted within the great empire of the dawn and a shy. So because of this, we know dragons and dragon lords were also present within that ancient society as well. Interestingly, if the word dragon is used to describe this hero within this prophecy, this would explain Maester Aemon's comments regarding Stannis' lineage and the assumption that Azor Ahai must have blood of the dragon. Stannis. Stannis has some of the dragon blood in him, yes. His brothers did as well. Rael, Egg's little girl. She was how they came by it. Their father's mother. She used to call me Uncle Maester when she was a little girl. I remembered that, so I allowed myself to hope. Perhaps I wanted to. We all deceive ourselves when we want to believe. Melisandre most of all, I think. The sword is wrong. She has to know that. Light without heat and empty glamour. The sword is wrong and the false light can only lead us deeper into darkness, Sam. Daenerys is our hope. Additionally, this would explain the Targaryen obsession with this prophecy. Because if this prophecy does refer to this savior as a dragon, with the assumption being that this hero would have the blood of the dragon, then after the doom, it would only make sense that the Targaryens would believe themselves to one day produce this prophesied savior, as they eventually became the last dragon lords left in the world. And if one were to read this prophecy and interpret it in the literal sense, then this might explain why both Ares and Arian Targaryen both had the strange belief they would not die if they were burned, but would rather be reborn as a literal dragon. Ares meant to have the greatest funeral pyre of them all, though if truth be told, I do not believe he expected to die. Like Ares and Brightflame before him, Ares thought the fire would transform him, that he would rise again, reborn as a dragon, and turn all his enemies to ash. But that is not the only nugget to be found relating to this prophecy. Once you understand this prophecy is describing this hero as a dragon and its implications, something else becomes much more significant. The man had a brother's hair, but he was taller, and his eyes were dark indigo rather than lilac. Aegon, he said to a woman nursing a newborn babe in a great wooden bed, what better name for a king? Will you make a song for him? The woman asked. 
He has a song, the man replied. He is the prince that was promised, and his is the song of ice and fire. He looked up when he said it, and his eyes met Danny's, and it seemed as if he saw her standing there beyond the door. There must be one more, he said, though whether he was speaking to her or the woman in the bed she could not say. The dragon has three heads. He went to the window seat, picked up a harp, and ran his fingers lightly over its silvery strings. The dragon has three heads. This is a concept introduced to us when Danny enters the house of the Undying. Rhaegar mentions it in one of her visions, and the Undying Ones themselves again utter this phrase. I have come for the gift of truth, Danny said. In the long hall, the things I saw. Were they true visions or lies? Past things or things to come? What did they mean? The shape of shadows. Morrow's not yet made. Drink from the cup of ice. Drink from the cup of fire. Mother of dragons. Child of three. Three? She did not understand. Three heads has the dragon. The ghost chorus yammered inside her skull, with never a lip moving, never a breath stirring the still blue air. Mother of dragons. Child of storm. The whispers became a swirling song. So, child of three. Three heads has the dragon. Then we also see this phrase a third time as Maester Aemon's dying words. After that, the old man spent more time sleeping than awake, curled up beneath a pile of furs in the captain's cabin. Sometimes he would mutter in his sleep. When he woke, he'd call for Sam, insisting that he had to tell him something. But oft as not, he would have forgotten what he meant to say by the time that Sam arrived. Even when he did recall, his talk was all a jumble. He spoke of dreams and never named the dreamer, of a glass candle that could not be lit, and eggs that would not hatch. He said the Sphinx was the riddle, not the Riddler, whatever that meant. He asked for Sam to read for him from a book by Septon Barth, whose writings had been burned during the reign of Baylor the Blessed. Once he woke up weeping. The dragon must have three heads, he wailed, but I am too old and frail to be one of them. I should be with her, showing her the way, but my body has betrayed me. So Danny's vision of Rhaegar, the Undying Ones, and Maester Aemon's dying words have all mentioned this, but what does it mean? Well, according to Jorah, we supposedly have our answer. Daenerys has three dragons, and the sigil of House Targaryen is a three-headed dragon meant to represent Aegon and his sisters, who also rode three dragons. Three dragons means there must be three dragon riders. Your grace, he conceded. The dragon has three heads, remember? You have wondered at that ever since you heard it from the warlocks in the House of Dust. Well, here's your meaning. Balerion, Meraxes, and Vagar, ridden by Aegon, Rhaenys, and Visenya, the three-headed dragon of House Targaryen, three dragons, and three riders. According to common belief throughout the fandom, we have taken Jorah's words to heart and believe this is all in reference to Danny requiring two other riders in her quest. But is that the answer? Did Jorah Mormont solve what the Undying were telling Danny? And now this is where it gets interesting. If the Azor Ahai prophecy is referring to our hero as a dragon and the dragon has three heads, a new possibility presents itself. And that possibility is that we are dealing with three prophesied saviors, not one. The key to this is again in Maester Aemon's dying words. As he lay dying, he is distraught that he is unable to help Daenerys, and he becomes delirious, and he's attempting to tell Sam something, but Sam is unable to interpret Maester Aemon's message. When he woke, he'd call for Sam insisting that he had to tell him something, but oft as not, he would have forgotten what he meant to say by the time that Sam arrived. Even when he did recall, his talk was all a jumble. He spoke of dreams and never named the dreamer, of a glass candle that could not be lit, and eggs that would not hatch. He said the Sphinx was the riddle, not the Riddler, whatever that meant. 
he asked for Sam to read for him from a book by Septon Barth, whose writings had been burned during the reign of Baylor the Blessed. Once he woke up weeping. The dragon must have three heads, he wailed, but I am too old and frail to be one of them. I should be with her, showing her the way. So this is where Maester Aemon tells Sam the dragon must have three heads. And he is saying this during a time when he is saying a lot of other things, which might be helpful to Sam and possibly Danny, but Sam is unable to understand what he is referring to. And among the things he mentions, he states, the Sphinx is the riddle, not the riddler. So a little backstory. In our own real world, Sphinxes were a rather ancient phenomena used in sculpture as guardians and various monuments and they can also be found in art and literature. The most popular reference to a sphinx within literature is told within the story of Oedipus. In the original Greek myth, the sphinx is a monster with the head of a woman, the body of a lion, and the wings of a bird, who guarded the road to Thebes, and those who could not answer her riddle were killed. So Oedipus is on the road to Thebes, and he encounters the sphinx, and being the clever guy that he is, he solves the riddle, and the Sphinx then throws herself off a cliff, and Oedipus continues on his tragic hero's journey. Well, within our author's world, Sphinxes are also a thing. They are also used as sculptures, guardians, and monuments. And according to Tyrion, there is also a tale of dragons riddling with Sphinxes. So there may in fact be a parallel story or myth within A Song of Ice and Fire that we just haven't heard yet. But we don't need to know the riddle the Sphinx told the dragon. According to Maester Aemon, the Sphinx is the riddle. The Sphinx itself is the thing that's important. Now, one pearl of wisdom that I've taken from the history of Westeros is that George R. R. Martin often gives us the answer before he poses the question. And interestingly enough, in one version of Oedipus by playwright John Cocteau called The Infernal Machine, the Sphinx was tired of tearing people apart, and in order to go into retirement, she actually gives Oedipus the answer to her riddle before posing the question. So knowing that this is something that our author has a habit of doing, there is a fairly good chance we have already been given the answer to this mystery. We just didn't understand the question. In the prologue of A Feast for Crows, the same book we see Maester Aemon tell Sam the Sphinx is the riddle. We are introduced to a character nicknamed Sphinx, and while it's likely Mr. Amon is referring to actual sphinxes, our author may be dropping some clues as to the meaning of this mystery within this chapter. So let's take a look. Within the prologue, some acolytes of the Citadel are around the quill and tankard shooting apples and discussing the tales of dragons being told by sailors at port. It appears word of Danny and her dragons has reached the port of Old Town, but the tales are many and confusing. The tales are not the same, insisted Armin. Dragons in Ashai, dragons in Karth, dragons in Marine, Dothraki dragons, dragons freeing slaves, each telling differs from the last. Only in details. Melander grew more stubborn when he drank, and even when sober, he was bullheaded. All speak of dragons and a beautiful young queen. So, Melander and Armin are arguing upon what these tales could mean, but our Sphinx Alaris has their own two cents to add to the conversation. One last apple, promised Alaris, and I will tell you what I suspect about these dragons. Alaris then shoots the last apple and misses, but then proceeds to tell the rest of the acolytes what these tales could mean. The dragon has three heads he announced in his soft Dornish drawl. Is this a riddle? Rune wanted to know. Sphinxes always speak in riddles in the tales. No riddle, Alaris sipped his wine. The rest of them were quaffing tankards of the fearsomely strong cider that the quill and tankard was renowned for, but he preferred the strange sweet wines of his mother's country. Even in Old Town, such wines did not come cheap. It had been Lazy Leo who dubbed Alaris the Sphinx, a sphinx was a bit of this, a bit of that, a human face, the body of a lion, the wings of a hawk. Alaris was the same. His father was a Dornishman, his mother a black-skinned summer islander. 
So here we have Alaris, our Sphinx, repeating the same line uttered by the Undying Ones, by Rhaegar, and by Maester Aemon. The dragon has three heads. Rune then replies, Is this a riddle? And we then learn what a Sphinx actually is within A Song of Ice and Fire, and why Alaris has earned this nickname. Now, Alaris in this passage was actually referring to the Targaryen heraldric banner, and suggested this dragon queen was none other than Daenerys Targaryen. But the subtext here is interesting. Because just as we have Maester Aemon with his dying words stating, the dragon must have three heads, and the Sphinx is the riddle, we have a character nicknamed Sphinx stating in the prologue of the same book, the dragon has three heads. And is this a riddle? Is the reply. So we see a connection being tied between a riddle and the dragon possessing three heads. But from Maester Aemon's comments, we know the riddle is the Sphinx itself. And luckily, we are told what a Sphinx is within A Song of Ice and Fire. According to Lazy Leo, a Sphinx is a bit of this, a bit of that, a human face, the body of a lion, the wings of a hawk. So he lists three things, which are a match for the Sphinx in Oedipus, which is a human face, the body of a lion, and the wings of a bird. So like the Sphinx in Oedipus, a Sphinx is something composed of many things, which is how Alaris received his nickname. Because like a Sphinx, Alaris is also several things. So if the Sphinx is the riddle, then what a Sphinx actually is, is many things in one. And according to Lazy Leo, we see him list three components. So when looking at this from the context of the dragon having three heads, the riddle is that even though the Sphinx is one thing, it is one thing composed of many, just as Azor Ahai is also one thing composed of many. In addition to what we have just discussed, a hint to this trinity can also be found in the religion of R'hllor itself. The religion of R'hllor is a basic monotheistic religion with dualistic deities that are constantly at war. According to their faith, R'hllor represents light and that which is good, while the Great Other represents darkness and that which is evil. In several interviews, our author has mentioned how the religion of Zoroastrianism has played a role in inspiring and shaping this religion, and indeed, Zoroastrianism does in fact carry a similar framework in many of these basic concepts. But another similarity to the religion of R'hllor is the apocalyptic one. According to the Zoroastrian religion, it has also been prophesied that the world will fall into darkness, cold, and winter, and in proper end-of-days tradition, a messiah has been prophesied to save them. But according to Zoroastrianism, their messiah, who was referred to as the Soshan or the Syoshant, is not one person, but three. Three saviors, three prophesied heroes, who will one day save the world from darkness. So just as the religion that inspired R'hllor has three saviors, I believe there is a strong possibility the Azor Ahai prophecy is also in reference to three saviors. This in turn further clears up the argument for the prince that was promised and Azor Ahai being different heroes. The main argument of which is that Azor Ahai alone just didn't work to explain our two strong contenders for this hero, when the answer to this conundrum is that they are both Azor Ahai and they will both fulfill this prophecy. They are two heads of the three-headed dragon. The only question remains is, who the third head is? Well, that about wraps things up for today. My next video will be out in the next month or so, and we will be discussing the original Long Night. And once we do that, a few confusing portions of the TV series finale is going to make a little bit more sense. The third video in this series will be covering the identity of the third head of Azor Ahai in the present timeline. So be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell to receive notifications. If you like this video, 
be sure to give it a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button, and leave a comment below. Thanks for watching!